First of all, uh, the name of this talk, Software Delivery and the Rube Goldberg Machine. What is the problem we are trying to solve? Um, that is something that I, the first time I heard that phrase, what are you really trying to solve, was when I was an intern um, coming out of, out of school. And um, I was on a, you know, brand new junior developer on a team. And um, we had all of these fantastical ideas on how to do things and, and how to uh, code what we want to do and add features and whatever. But ultimately, uh, we had to always answer this question, what is the problem we are trying to solve? Meaning we had to stay focused. We can't go off on all of these tangents. Uh, we needed to stay focused on the actual problem. So uh, quickly, just a little bit about me and my background. Uh, first and foremost, I am a developer, have been for many, many years, over 20, um, all the way from an intern to principal engineer. And um, during that period of time, I started to speak. Uh, it was several years before I was able to get into it regularly, um, you, you know, either from family obligations or work obligations. But um, ultimately, that was something I wanted to do more of. And I was introduced to some amazing folks at uh, what was called an unconference at the time. And I don't know if all of you are familiar with what unconferences are. Um, they are not the same thing as a formal conference. Uh, it's usually with a smaller group of people and uh, the agenda for the conference isn't decided beforehand. It's decided while you're there each and every day. And it depends, you know, who, who is there, who are the experts that have come and what are the topics that are um, most, you know, that everyone is interested in talking about. Anyway, um, during one of those on conferences, uh, there were some sessions on how to speak, how to do public speaking, how to submit to conferences, things like that. And that was something I was really excited about doing. So moved on to JFrog. I'm um, going on my third year now here at JFrog as a developer advocate. And that's what we do a lot is a lot of speaking to groups like you. Um, I do still some coding, like, you know, putting together demos, um, working on open source projects, things like that. But it's not so much more um, you know, as it was for me in the past, being directly involved in production code. But over those years, I've learned a lot, and it's time for me to share and pass that down. We need to get this next generation up and, um, you know, get them up to speed on how we do things and how to do things successfully. I am a Java champion. Um, that was my primary background was Java server-side um, coding, but Obviously, uh, you know, I rarely uh, meet a Java developer that isn't doing anything else other than Java. So, um, you know, there's a lot of um, Python, shell scripting, uh, JavaScript, um, other languages that were uh, in, you know, in my history as well. I was really fortunate to work for a services company for quite a while as an intern and my first, you know, one of my first professional positions. Um, and so we, we worked on whatever came in the door. And so that gave me quite, you know, breadth of experience across different types of projects. I'm also a Docker captain. I do pay attention to what's going on in the industry right now, especially since uh, containers in production are becoming more widely used. Uh, a lot of cloud native applications being developed out there. Uh, I like to pay attention to that both both the Docker side of things and also, um, you know, open container initiative uh, stuff that goes on. So alternatives to Docker as well. The whole idea of containers is pretty interesting to me. Um, my Twitter handle's here, my LinkedIn is here. Um, I can share that again later if you like, if you want to reach out and connect or follow, that would be awesome. Okay, in reference to the title of this talk, let's just get into it. Um, this is one of my shorter talks. It's going to be more high level concept driven and I'm hoping that it will generate some discussion about some of the day-to-day -day problems that a lot of us have, especially those that are involved in the whole pipeline um, of delivering your software. Um, one of the most important things this, this also includes developers. Um, I like to bring in the developer uh, from that perspective. That is the best perspective that I have. So we'll hear a lot from that side as well. If I'm going to make an analogy like this, 
um, I can't help but share a little bit of trivia about Rube Goldberg machines. That needs to happen. Obviously, that's a pretty easy internet search. They're very popular. Um, but for anyone who's not familiar with what it is, a Rube Goldberg machine is just a ridiculously complex and inefficient machine, usually composed of a high number of moving parts that sets out to achieve a simple goal. I've seen these before. I've played with them before. Um, they're, they're fun to work with and to watch. Um, I think I've seen them in a couple airports that I've been in, and um, you can almost get hypnotized watching these things and how they work. But some new things that I did not know, uh, Rube Goldberg was a Pulitzer Prize winning inventor, innovator, and a cartoonist. And he's who made uh, these namesake machines popular through his cartoons. And the one shown here is called Self-Operating at Napkin. Uh, you can see all the necessary steps labeled. Obviously, this is a cartoon. This isn't a real machine. I didn't realize Rube Goldberg machines started out this way. Another interesting fact is that Rube Goldberg is the only person whose name is in the Merriam-Webster dictionary as an adjective. I thought that was pretty interesting. So uh, something to look forward to if you want to get famous, try to get your name into the dictionary like he did. Another thing that I ran into doing a little bit of research on Rube Goldberg machines was finding out there's actually a contest that's held every year for participants to create these. You can go to rubegoldberg.org to find out more details on that. But each year has a theme, and this year the focus was on literacy and the challenge to create one of these machines um, to open a book for you. Uh, that was pretty clever, I think, for this year. And you can find videos on that website of the top 10 selections. Uh, they're super cute. There's a lot of really clever kids out there making these. So you can certainly uh, do your own research on Rube Goldberg. Um, but let's talk about software. That's what we're here for. And what am I talking about? What is this analogy that I'm making between software delivery pipelines and Rube Goldberg machines? I want to expound a little bit more on that analogy. And there are three characteristics of Rube Goldberg machines that I think apply very well to software delivery pipelines today. And the first one is that there are a lot of moving parts. Uh, I remember when I first got started, um, um, more on the ops side of things, actually I, I became a part of a DevOps team, so there was a lot of new material for me to absorb, and I just remember being pretty overwhelmed with how many different tools uh, were involved in the whole process, and I had a lot of learning to do. The second one is inefficient. Um, Rube Goldberg machines are notoriously inefficient on purpose. Uh, sometimes our software delivery pipelines are that as well, not so much on purpose. And the third, the tendency of these things to be unreliable and unsafe. If you look at some of the more of the Rube Goldberg cartoons, you'll see some of them that are pretty funny that uh, you absolutely wouldn't want to put you know, make real because they are horribly unsafe. Um, someone could get hurt pretty easy. Um, our pipelines too, our software delivery pipelines um, can be unreliable sometimes and also unsafe. We will talk a little bit more about that later. So let's hit on this, the first characteristic. Uh, I wanna emphasize, you know, my intent here is not to make, be disrespectful or make some broad sweeping judgment that all software practitioners are behaving in a ridiculous or unintelligent way. That's not what I'm saying. But I, I think um, I can empathize wholeheartedly that software development and delivery is not an easy problem to solve, especially if you're new to today's landscape and all of those components and tool chains that are can be potentially involved in your delivery pipelines. And this became really apparent to me when I co-authored this book with a, a few of my colleagues that was published earlier this year called DevOps Tools for Java Developers. And my co-authors and I, we came together with the intent of just um, putting together for readers much of the knowledge and background that's required in order to develop and deliver software efficient, efficiently and safely. And um, I've listed 
a lot of the topics here that are explored in the book, uh, the basics of DevOps methodology, source control, of course, containers, microservices, uh, continuous integration, super important, package management, uh, securing your binaries, and deployment. Um, there's a, a couple of things as well that we discuss. And the material here gives you a pretty good idea of what you're getting into. It'll undoubtedly, though, result in deeper dives on many of these subjects in order to develop a solid uh, development and delivery pipeline. We did discuss some of the most common tools that are used in the industry. We even touched a bit on Kubernetes. Uh, but what became, becomes abundantly clear here is that the entire process can be pretty overwhelming and significantly more so in a cloud native environment. Did a quick Google search on the largest Rube Goldberg machine. And it just so happened that on December 10th, 2021, there was a video posted. Uh, this is a Rube Goldberg machine that has 427 steps. And this, these kids made the Guinness Book of World Records. Um, pretty incredible. And I just love how excited they are at the end that it worked. I wonder how many times this was recorded. Um, the, from beginning to end, it's about four minutes and 26 seconds. Obviously, I'm not going to show that whole video here. You can go look it up yourself. But um, just the end part of it here is pretty exciting. And uh, they were pretty thrilled to get this done. On that note, many of you have probably seen this already. Uh, this is the CNCF, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, the Cloud Native Landscape Map. Um, I don't expect you to actually be able to see any of the logos here. <laughs> it's massive. There's a lot here. Uh, just to highlight one of the smaller sections called the orchestration and management, uh, it's subdivided into a few other categories. There are 20 tools that are under scheduling and orchestration. There are seven more under coordination and service discovery. There's 10 under the remote procedure call section. There's 21 under service proxy. Um, there's 19 under API gateway and another 17 under service mesh, which I thought was pretty interesting. I've done talks before on service mesh when they were first starting to come out. So um, I find that interesting that there's so many tools now available. Um, that accomplish that. I don't know how many of you like jigsaw puzzles here. They're one of my favorite things to do. Um, I think when I retire, I'll probably just do one right after another. <laughs> They're just a ton of fun. I have a lot. Um, I like to do them repeatedly. I'm not too good at committing to gluing them together. I like to do them and then take them apart and then put them together in a different way. I just love jigsaw puzzles. So uh, the CNCF landscape became a meme. Uh, an earlier version of it made rounds on Twitter a couple years ago as a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. I thought that was hilarious. And I went to search to see if someone has actually made a jigsaw puzzle like this. And I was thrilled to see that it was available on Etsy. But after 42 of them were sold, it's now sold out. And um, there's one review up there, which I thought was cute. Uh, the puzzle to end all puzzles. Anyway, someday maybe I will get a CNCF landscape jigsaw puzzle. So I think I made the case for a lot of moving parts. And the fact that there are a lot of moving parts, that's not necessarily a bad thing in and of itself. Um, Really, it's just uh, which ones you choose to use for your particular use case and how you use them. Uh, that can lead to a measure of inefficiency, which is our second characteristic we'll talk about. If you are new to this landscape, uh, it's going to take you a while to find your place. And this is totally reasonable to expect. It will take the expertise of an entire team from development to operations. Although uh, some have been involved across the board from beginning to end, it's usually expected to take years of experience to be able to do that. It's a tall order to ask one person to know everything. And this is one of the biggest misconceptions about DevOps methodology that I come across all of the time. And this is the idea that a single person should know in depth all of the stages of the pipeline. 
it's important to have awareness, yes, but it's also more effective to have a team that works and communicates together all within their areas of expertise. Uh, just like, you know, I wouldn't expect maybe someone whose expertise in operations and in deployments, I wouldn't expect them to be diving into, you know, our Java code, for example, and and trying to fix bugs in there um, for with the same hesitation would I go into, you know, something that is um, deployment configuration and start messing with those, um, you know, levers without having that communication um, among the team. So uh, you don't need to know everything. Uh, again, be aware of the different parts and what your software is doing. But as far as going in depth, to everything, uh, much more advantageous for you to stay within your uh, area of expertise. And above all, know that you will make mistakes, uh, especially with you know deploying quickly. Um, there will be problems, um, but a successful team is going to deal with those problems as they come, and you'll you'll get that churn. And um, the important part is just to learn continuously, evaluate your solutions, make changes. Try again. I don't know how many of you here remember typewriters or have ever used one. I'm uh, this is going to age me a bit, but I do remember using typewriters as a kid. It was actually my mom's. She had a mechanical typewriter. I also remember running out of correction tape. Um, this is another Rube Goldberg machine that uses a drill to press the space bar on a typewriter. Uh, this one reminds me of something pretty specific with software delivery pipelines, especially. One of the more interesting phenomena I encounter most is that some software or tools are used in ways that were unanticipated and often in ways that are unintended by the creators and designers. And this can be due to a number of factors. Um, some of these could be a lack of due diligence when evaluating a tool for use um, or simply an attachment to a beloved tool and a desire to make it be the one-stop shop. I've been there definitely in my junior years. You learn something, you get comfortable with it, you just want it to work for everything. Another one is uh, the development of a pipeline ad hoc. Uh, this implies a lack of planning or agreement amongst the team and stakeholders on what actions are required and where. And this can actually lead to several different tools being used that overlap and are unnecessarily redundant. Another could be the unavailability of a specific required feature, either because the team doesn't know where to look or isn't allowed to use available solutions because of licensing or other corporate restrictions. And these are all common reasons, but regardless, this can cause an assortment of issues. And a big one is um, glue code. Uh, this can be a maintenance nightmare. An example of glue code that provides uh, compatibility between two different tools that might make sense at the time, but then an update to either tool on each side uh, that can break the glue code. Another is that uh, projects or tools that originally had a specific focus become spaghetti code, unmanageable, and bloated. Uh, and that's just due to an attempt to respond to community requests for features that are outside of their focus. It may be that a different tool altogether would be suited. And there's a lot to unpack there, especially when it comes to effectively meeting the needs of the community in open source projects. But it is always a challenge to push back on things that completely make sense for a specific use case, but don't make sense for the project as a whole. So all of these things I listed, uh, they can lead to some pretty severe inefficiencies in your pipelines. I think we have that checked. Um, I know one example that I had personally, it was a DevOps team that I started working on um, several years ago. And it was a brand new project that had been brought in from a, a third party that had built this initial project. And, and the idea was, you know, we wanted to bring it internal, um, have a development team maintain it, add some features, things like that. 
The problem was is that we did not have a pipeline developed. Um, I was, you know, a lo- pretty much a lone developer on the team. It's a very small team, like I said, a small project, so uh, risk wasn't as high in this regard. But uh, what I found was that in the past, uh, this particular project was manually deployed, and it was deployed using a script. And this script was located on various machines or even on, you know, production servers uh, and used there. So you could have, you know, different versions of this script in different places. And uh, when it came time to roll back or uh, deploy a new project, you never knew if you were doing the right thing. So obviously that was something that we tackled first uh, was to get all of that, you know, uh, coordinated and make sure that our, uh, you know, deployments and our environment um, specifics were all, you know, put into source control. Um, That was a a pretty interesting experience for me. Uh, One that really, really highlighted the need to um, communicate with, you know, ops. Um, Like I said, this was a brand new DevOps team, so we were taking baby steps. Um, One thing that I wanted to say about that too, um, being on a DevOps team, you know, there's this idea that perhaps developers don't need to be so involved in deployments. But the reason I say it's so important to be aware of what's going on in the pipeline and how your software is deployed, I mean, this is, you know, one of the whole reasons that microservices came about. I mean, when you understand how your software is being deployed, you may make completely different design decisions that go all the way back to the beginning of the project. Um, You may choose to, you know, write your software in such a way, your application in such a way that it can be broken up and scaled a little bit differently, especially if it's intended for a cloud native environment. Um, So it is important for developers to understand. Uh, They also need to understand, you know, that uh, what needs to be uh, variable as far as, I don't know, something as simple as ports that need to be um, different, you know, depending on whether you're deploying to, development environment, a staging environment, or production environment. So these are things that you need to build those levers in so that operations can do what needs to be done. All right, we have one item left here. Uh, This one is pretty serious when it comes to pipelines, this tendency to be unreliable and unsafe. Excuse me. This is a slide that I often see in in our corporate deck here at JFrog. This is a detailed step-by-step of the software development lifecycle. This is really busy, but I like it because it does a really good job of highlighting how overwhelming DevOps can be when you're presented with all of this stuff in the ecosystem. The space is huge. It's easy to get lost in the mix, uh, but this whole process is an attempt to answer the questions, how do I build everything, test everything, and deploy everything? Where do dependencies come from? How do I keep everything secure? How do I include automation to help increase efficiency and reduce human error? And as expected, there's quite a few product products and solutions represented in here that handle artifact management and storage, uh, distribution, security scanning on packages, And this setup has some really strong integrations with other components and frameworks that are out there that you're likely already familiar with and using today, like uh, various build and dependency managers like Maven and NPM, uh, continuous integration servers, CircleCI, Jenkins, and then uh, provisioning tools like Chef and Puppet. But what this uh, particular slide doesn't really address is what needs to happen after deployment Those are tools that are around monitoring and uh, troubleshooting production issues. Um, This is a whole nother side of the development process that sometimes gets ignored. And it's one of the most important because even after you've deployed to production, you're not done. There's there's always improvement. Uh, There's monitoring. There's observing your customer behavior. If your application, you know, is, you know, SaaS or something like that, you want to observe how your customers are using your product. And then all of that feedback, feed, you know, goes back uh, to the beginning of the cycle where we begin again. We add features, we fix bugs, things like that. 
Even if you've managed to cobble your system together with all of these parts, uh, there's likely points in here that include that glue code that I spoke of earlier to handle various integrations between different tools. And this can lead to a measure of unreliability. And as a developer, uh, there's a phrase, phrase that I've heard often, um, happy path coding or happy path programming. Um, just like with happy path coding, you can easily end up with a happy path pipeline where everything needs to behave just so in a certain way in order for um, a successful end result. And uh, reliable pipelines more often than not come from a lot of trial and error much like I imagine a Rube Goldberg machine would. Uh, remember that first, that largest Rube Goldberg machine? It took them three months to build that. And um, remember how excited they were at the end? I remember the first time that I built a pipeline and actually ran through to completion. I was pretty excited too <laughs> that it worked. Um, glue code or not, um, everywhere on this slide where you see a green connecting line, uh, those are the places to start looking for weaknesses and putting serious thought into what to do when there's a break in one of those connections. Is it the is the result that the entire pipeline breaks down, or are there measures you should be taking to handle paths that are not happy? There's actually um, a ton involved in putting a full pipeline together. Uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention the parts that are terribly unsafe, uh, if not addressed. Uh, this, this diagram comes from salsa.dev. Uh, that stands for, that's the acronym for supply chain levels for software artifacts. That is actually a, sec a security framework. It's a checklist of standards um, to help prevent your pipelines from being tampered with, um, to keep your packages secure and your infrastructure secure as much as possible. And between your source code and delivery of your product or deployment of your service, there are places you need to take extra care to protect your supply chain. And each of these red triangles that you see here those represent an opportunity for a disruption. And as a developer, uh, I focus a lot on the build parts. So uh, the continuous integration and um, the initial development builds. In a lot of my talks, I focus on dependencies. In particular, all of the pieces and parts of libraries and other artifacts that your code depends on. And this aspect becomes even more important when you start packaging all these things into containers. And uh, one of the most crucial areas to harden is your build process during continuous integration. You must ensure that the dependencies you're pulling in are exactly what you expect them to be. For example, they need to be an expected version of software. You must also verify that you're using a trusted dependency and not a malicious package that just so happens to have a similar name so um, paying attention to all of these things is important. This is a uh, slide directly from another talk, actually, um, since, and it's from a, uh, you know, containers and uh, using, using Docker containers responsibly talk. I won't get into too, many, too much detail here, but uh, just since using a, a Docker file is pretty common, um, there's a lot to talk about as far as dependencies go. Uh, this, graphic of a glacier, I'm sure you've seen it over and over again, is pretty overused. But the concept that software is potentially made up of a ton of components that a developer might not have first-hand knowledge of cannot be understated. These applications and services that are built today are more complex than ever, and developers generally don't want to recreate the wheel if it isn't necessary. We're trying to be efficient and quick in our work. And containers especially have this problem because uh, not only do we package the software we've done um, and put it in the container, but uh, with a container image, we often build these container images with uh, parent or base images. And where are these coming from? This is something you should know. Uh, even as a developer, all the way at the beginning of the pipeline, you should know where your base and parent images are coming from. And just for fun, uh, let's walk through 
A, an example Docker file, I think some of this will become even more clear to you. Uh, since building is so important, let's talk about how container images are built. Um, and this is just a contrived example just to highlight a few areas to watch for in your own Docker files if you have them. Um, line one, we have right away, this is a parent or base image and uh, it's called untrusted parent image. Obviously, they're not gonna be named. So, you know, not so easy to spot. But a um, couple of things about this, there's no tag or SHA identifier on this and we don't know where this parent image comes from. Um, if you remember the SolarWinds hack, that was back in September of 2019. Um, that was a, a pretty nasty attack. Um, that was actually done when a binary was switched out um, from under the company uh, after in the CI system, in the continuous integration system. Um, and it was particularly nasty because that binary was even signed. Uh, and it uh, suggested that there may be some you know, access to the continuous integration system itself. And uh, it's a good idea to, um, you know, make sure that you know where your dependencies are coming from. Um, like I said, this in this particular case, it was even signed. Um, maybe it would be better to use a SHA, confirm that the correct SHA is being used. Uh, moving on lines two through four, we've got some additional problems with not specifying versions of packages and not keeping up with updates. If you remember the Equifax data breach, uh, that was in July of 2017. And, um, and then the most recent one, the log for shell attack, uh, that vulnerability that was discovered. Um, you know, the Equifax data breach was just due to the fact that there was a vulner vulnerable package, it was known, just like on line number four, but it wasn't updated in time, um, you know, for whatever reasons. Um, that's that's what happened, and the end result was pretty embarrassing for them. Um, Blog for Shell was actually a pretty good example. Vulnerability was discovered, and there was very quick action by a lot of companies. Uh, they did learn their lesson and update uh, this stuff. And, um, uh, you know, that was a pretty big one for me, especially being a Java developer. Uh, using Log4j is very common. Uh, so using these libraries, they were involved in uh, everything. Uh, even if you weren't using it directly, likely there was a dependency that was being pulled in that was using it. So this was a pretty big one. And uh, there was a lot of effort and a lot of money put into making sure that things got updated very quickly. Um, line six, uh, that could be like an efficiency and performance problem. Um, and one point I'd like to make is, um, you know, that copy line, the dot dot, it's basically copying everything from your local machine and putting it in, well, everything in your, in your um, context that you've sent and moving it into the container. Um, it would be good to use a dot, uh, docker ignore file. It's very much like a git ignore file. Um, use that to make sure you're only copying things over that you intend. You don't want to be copying secrets. You don't want to be copying <clears throat> um, maybe configuration that's for you know your machine. Um, maybe you don't want to copy your git directory over there. Um, there's a lot of stuff that you wouldn't want to just throw into a container. All right, number seven, line seven. I see this a lot. Uh, I see, you know, curl statements, uh, wget statements in Docker files. These are pointing to external resources, which in and of itself isn't a bad thing unless you don't have control of that resource. Uh, I have an example where one time um, I saw a Docker file which was actually reaching out um, and it was a legitimate reason. It, it was using an installation script from a proprietary product uh, from another company um, using their installation script to install their product into the uh, image so that it could be used in the container. And the problem with that is that, uh, you know, invariably they're going to change that someday. Uh, maybe the script moves to a completely different location. Maybe it just gets deleted altogether. Maybe it gets updated and updated in a way that's incompatible with your, your current setup. So 
if you're going to have something like this, it's better to bring that script internal so that you manage it, you version it, you update it on your schedule, not on someone else's schedule. Uh, number nine, that's running as root. That little start shell script that starts, you know, when you've launched the container, it's running as root. Make sure that you're using the principle of least privilege, um, that you're, you know, providing a user and group so that uh, you're not running as root when you don't need to. These are just a few problems, and I have other talks about this that go more into depth and detail on these items and more. Um, but I come across these pretty frequently in Docker files. This is definitely not an exhaustive list, but it's a really good place to start. Focus on your build for sure. OK, I think we satisfied those three characteristics, the um, many moving parts, yes, inefficiencies, yes, tendency to be unreliable and unsafe, yes. And we've complained a lot uh, during this entire talk, but uh, you're probably wondering now if there's any real solutions to these problems. And there are a ton of tools out there to explore that will help you with real case scenarios. And as overwhelming as it is, the CNCF landscape, for example, at least lists some tools within categories that will be helpful to you. And for now, quite a bit of research is required to vet and evaluate those solutions you choose to use. Uh, the hardest part is just getting all of those pieces to fit. The industry right now is ripe for real uh, holistic solutions that solve the basic problems of continuously delivering and updating software as well as monitoring and troubleshooting once that software is out in production. And it's simple to say, but there's a ton of one-off tools out there that have grown out of very specific engineering problems. That's where you get all of these pieces involved when you know one group tries to make all of these pieces fit for their particular use case scenario. What we really need now is agreement in the industry on best practices. And some organizations are coming together to work on these issues. And one important um, effort that's an example of this is an effort between JFrog and Nginx um, that will harden and improve the MARA project. MARA is an acronym for a Modern Application Reference Architecture. That was announced last year at um, Nginx's Sprint uh, 2.0. It's basically a framework for deploying any containerized application in a reliable and repeatable way. It's completely open source, um, but there's definitely some things in there um, that I spotted to, you know, looking, uh, there's ways that we can improve this and make this uh, more usable for more engineering teams. That's just one example of organizations that are working together uh, to produce open source that's available to everyone and to push forward uh, best practices. Uh, but I also want to mention the efforts that are happening right now with the uh, Continuous Delivery Foundation. And um, they, uh, you know, and there's a lot of other projects that uh, with that particular foundation, they're starting their um, journey to be adopted that are trying to solve a lot of these issues as well. Uh, the CD Foundation, Continuous Delivery Foundation, that's a sister organization to the CNCF. It also has a landscape map um, with a number of associated tools. It's not quite as overwhelming as the CNCF map. Um, mainly just because there's a limited focus on continuous delivery, especially. And now is a really good time to check out what they're doing regarding uh, interoper interoperability and outlining best practices. There's a number of organizations that are involved, and there are regular meetings uh, around these subjects um, that are open to the public. It's just a matter of going to their website and signing up for uh, the mailing list and getting involved in the Slack channels and um, starting to attend some of these meetings. Um, I'm the chair of the interoperability meeting, co-chair. And, uh, you know, we recently had, well, we have a list of projects right now that are coming to present. Um, and it's, it's been interesting to learn exactly how they work, what they do, what their uh, purpose is, uh, what problem they are trying to solve. And, um, making sure that they land in the right place and that they're interoperable with a lot of the other tools that we all need to use for our pipelines. Um, one interesting project that came out of the CD, CD Foundation 
Um, <clears throat> it's called CD Events. Definitely check that one out. Uh, it spun out from the Interoperability Special Interest Group originally. Um, this is the beginning of a specification for receiving and emitting events from various tools, and that would better support interoperability versus tight integration, uh, which can be difficult to maintain. Another project to consider taking a look at is Persia. Uh, this is basically a decentralized package registry, and it provides a measure of trust that you are actually getting the package that you think you're getting, that you want to get. And basically, um, it requires the uh, package to be built from source, and there needs to be a network consensus, meaning a quorum of trusted registries and nodes that agree that this is this version is correct, that it hasn't been uh, interfered with in any way uh, since it came from source. All right. Um, going to finish up here, leave you with a few links to look at. Of course, we have the landscape maps that I showed you. Those are really good starting points. Uh, there's a community page on the CD Foundation page. Uh, JFrog also has a community page with a lot of different you know, information and talks and workshops and stuff. And, um, and then, of course, um, the if you're interested in looking or contributing to the Mara project, uh, there is a blog that was announcing that reference architecture on the Nginx website. All right, that is what I had to share with you today. Um, do we have any questions? We've got a few minutes. Hey, Melissa. That was really, really interesting. To be honest, this is one of those, I was just sitting and watching, listening to you. I have a question and, you know, being a co-organizer, I'm going to abuse my powers and ask the questions before looking at the <laughs> question section. Of course. So uh, I, I love that uh, visual around that JFrog. Uh, you know, you showed the ecosystem where you had different stages and everything. Um, uh -huh. Is there in that pipeline or in that stages of pipeline, is there a section you can say this is the most important, this you have to do, or this is how it has to be? Is there like an important... Uh -huh. Let me go back to that because I think that I like that slide too. I use it in a lot of places. Oh, did I go too far? I went too far. I went right by it. Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, you can see that this this goes all the way through from development. Um, talks about you know how how dependencies are resolved for uh, the developer and for CI servers and stuff like that. Obviously, there's a lot here and there's some missing. We talked about that already. Um, the monitoring and stuff afterward that needs to happen in production. Um, but I think the most important part of a delivery pipeline to focus on is planning it in the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, figuring out that simplest thing that works um, getting your team together and whiteboarding your pipeline, meaning every single step needs to be accounted for so that everyone understands why and what is happening. And then when you choose the tools that you're going to use, be very clear and understand why, um, like what you need that tool to do for you and mm -hmm. why you've chosen it, meaning um, you need to document this. Um, mm -hmm. This is so important. There's so much documentation I see out there that explains how to do things and how to implement something, mm -hmm. but they forget why. Why do you do it this way? And that ends in, um, you know, the next person that joins the team, they want to change it. Mm -hmm. The next person that joins the team wants to change it again, you know, and then you end up, you could get in a situation where you just go back and forth <laughs> between a few different tools. So explaining why and really narrowing that down making sure everyone understands. Um, no, that's, that's brilliant. Um, and are there any, I mean, uh, I'll look at the question section in a sec, like just after this one, but are there any, let's say, um, specific tools from that this entire tool chain that you would recommend for folks who uh, want to just improve their, you know, pipelines or, you know, do good, do better? Yes. I love this question because it's like asking me what's the best language to learn. <laughs> <laughs> and I definitely have some personal opinions on what I like to use and stuff. But um, 
what I'd rather say is that every tool has their own strengths and weaknesses. It depends on your situation. And uh, whether, for example, uh, whether you use an open source tool or whether you use something off the shelf could totally depend on the rules of your organization. Mm -hmm. um, it could depend on you know, whether or not you need to be behind a firewall, whether you even have access to uh, the internet. Um, whether you're working for a government or a private agency, that'll make a difference. And whether or not you have funds and resources to maintain a tool that doesn't have uh, any kind of support contract, that will make a difference. Um, so it's not even just the tool itself, but you know, who's going to manage that tool, who's going to keep it updated, um, things like that. Those are all things to consider. And the most important thing is just to understand each tool uh, when you're doing the research and evaluating a tool, make sure you understand where it came from and what problem they were trying to solve so that you can avoid trying to make something do something it wasn't intended for, you know? Oh, brilliant. I love this answer because this is exactly what I use when I when people ask me, should I use Kubernetes? I just yes. tell them, go back to first principles. Ask exactly. yourself, what are you trying to do? All right. Exactly. There, there are a couple of questions, if you don't mind, and probably keep two or three. So Pyrisia is a blockchain network. So this is a question by Amrita ah, Nandu. Persia. So Pyrisia um, yeah, is a blockchain. It uses blockchain only to keep a record of what has been uploaded to the system. Okay. So I think that's a pretty good use. Uh, it, it uses that you know record. Right, brilliant. Okay, hope that answers. If it doesn't, let us know. There are a few questions in the chat as well. Uh, so I'll ask folks to add them to question, uh, questions tab, but I'll ask the one by Sayuj. Um, so the question is, will CD events and interoperability between vendors have an impact on these problems? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, even now, I know of projects that are... Um, making themselves CD event compatible so that, you know, they aren't behind. Um, one example is if it's fairly new, uh, it, it's actually coming up to, you know, try to be a part of the CD foundation. It's called J releaser. And that was one step that they took was to uh, make that particular tool uh, compatible with CD events. Um, if we see more and more of that happening, we're going to get more, uh, you know, companies engaged and supporting of this. And so we might even start seeing, you know, some off the shelf products, some commercial products uh, start supporting this as well and moving in that direction. It's to everyone's benefit to do so. And if you take a look at a lot of the uh, uh, people that are engaged in the uh, special interest groups that are running under the CD foundation, you'll see a, quite a variety of companies that are all involved and people attending and sharing their experiences and, mm. uh, you know, giving their input. That's super important. Brilliant. Um, cool. There's a follow-up from Amrita Bandhu. So, so uh, this follows from the Parisia question. So record of what language binding and its dependencies on JFrog database. Previously also it is there. Can you elaborate more on this? how it is used inside JFrog? I don't know, maybe, maybe that question makes sense. Um, well, JFrog, I mean, the, the platform itself is written in Java, mm -hmm. but it supports, I mean, it that is aside from what it's meant to do for you. It's meant to manage all of your packages and all of your binaries that you use in your code base, which could be pretty much anything. We support a, a ton of different languages, um, and I, I think like 30 and counting or something, um, even rust and Docker containers now, um, in, you know, NPM, Maven, Gradle, of course, we are going to support all of the Java stuff, um, Python, um, JavaScript, Go, Ruby, all of those things. So I, I hope that answered your question. Um, mm -hmm. but as far as managing packages and stuff, the JFrog platform does that. Mm -hmm. I think the question is around because all of that data lives inside JFrog database, like code dependencies and everything. How is ah, it used inside okay. JFrog? Yeah. Um, 
So there is an internal database. Um, for example, when you upload you know, packages to different repositories and stuff, um, the way that it stores those packages is it takes that SHA and says this SHA belongs in this repository. If you move stuff around or copy stuff to other repositories, um, it will use that SHA and use that database in order to prevent you know, having multiple copies of the same thing. Um, so the database itself will manage that for you. Mm -hmm. um, I honestly don't know which databases are supported right now. Um, mm -hmm. I, I know that it's something that you can set up yourself. You can choose the database. Uh, I know Postgres is supported, um, but I know others are supported as well if you choose to use something different. Cool. Um, okay, another one from Amrita Bandhu. Busy asking questions. So how blockchain is used to keep record of JFrog? Perisia use case inside JFrog. I think that's there. Oh, Persia is an open source project. It's supported by JFrog, but not. it's not part of the JFrog platform. Um, mm. It's meant for like open source projects mm. that are able to be built from source. Um, there is some agreement with... Uh, trusted registries like with um, you know Maven Central and with Docker Hub to handle some of those cases where you can't get like an exactly um, an exact build from source mm -hmm. like you can with some other projects like Go. Um, but the blockchain itself is just used to verify uh, to have that history of what what is in the system and what is approved. Cool. I hope that answers the questions. If not, you have details where to ask those questions. Yes. You know, we, we have stuff coming up, um, especially like uh, at KubeCon coming up. We're going to be having, um, you know, more information about Persia and stuff. That's a project that we, you know, is near and dear to our hearts. Um, we will have workshops on that and um, Hacker Gardens and things like that. We've done that in the past. So keep an eye on um, Persia, I think it's Persia.io. Yeah, no, brilliant. And follow Melissa. Um, yes. And you will have yeah, to I think, yours. Melissa, if you can um, post your LinkedIn URL on the chat section so the yeah. people can add you in, you know, um, if you guys have any more questions for Melissa, please don't hesitate to reach out to her. Um, we are not keeping Melissa for long because it is, uh, I believe, 1 a.m. her end. She is actually based in Denver, Colorado, uh, so she needs to sleep. Um, so, guys, uh, Melissa will be posting... Um, she has posted already her uh, Twitter account. Um, if you want to post your LinkedIn as well, uh, Melissa, so that people can add you. And again, guys, um, if you have any more questions for Melissa, uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to her. Um, the, the if they have events, um, you can Melissa can can give you more information on that. Or Ari as well, Ari, if you want to um post also your LinkedIn or any of your social media accounts. Um, on the chat section so that people can reach out to you. But thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Ari. And thank you, Pratik. Thank you, everyone. Um, okay. I do have... Okay. This is the last one. Um, Pratik, I think um, maybe let's just go ahead with the questions. Uh, the question from Amruta. Uh, Actually, it's not really a question. It's more of a... But yeah, go ahead. Yeah. No, it's just... Um... Once all the repos are added, it can be integrated. And I think it's more of a thanks. Uh, yeah, it's comment. more of a thanks. Uh, but right. yeah, no, that's very good. I think, yeah, we can wrap it here. Melissa, really, really thank you. Uh, and apologies, I didn't realize you were in Denver. I mean, I knew you were in Denver, but I was just going ahead with the question. <laughs> Interesting conversation. <laughs>